YouTube theologians, Pastor Wolf Miller here, Pastor Andrew Packer, <laughs> also Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Collinsville, Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> is, that, is that right? I can't. Close, Illinois. Answering questions that you send in, wolfmuller.co slash contact. Uh, always a lot of great questions. So this is a new format. We'll see how this goes. Pastor Packer, how are you? I'm well. How are you this morning? Great. God be praised. All right. You said, uh, I'm always nervous because you said, I got an easy one for you to start. And then, oh man, that's. <laughs> I, I do. This is easy. I mean, okay. I think it's easy to define. I have a follow up question to it of my own that, that maybe complicates it. But we'll go with the easy question to begin. Um, we have someone who sent in, Our Lord has blessed you with a teaching spirit. My entire family are blessed by your videos. Just recently listened to your video with Pastor Chad Bresson. Truly a blessing. So here's a question for one of your talks. What is meant by confessional Lutheran? Hmm. Um, so he just started going, it looks like, um, for the last four years to a, a confessional Lutheran church that was pretty far away, but has found one about half half the distance, about 30 minutes from their house. Um, but that's what he wants to know. When they say, what do you mean by confessional Lutheran? How should he answer? He generally responds, uh, a church that holds the Book of Concord and thus a closed table, but he thinks it'd be a great benefit if you would discuss this title or category of Lutheran along with the theological diversity within the LCMS. Thank you. That's a great question. So I think he's right, by the way, the answer. So when we say confessional Lutheran, we're talking about the confessions. Uh, so the word confession, by the way, is a biblical word. It means to speak the same way. And we normally uh, use it in two ways, the confession of sins, which means we speak the same way about ourselves that God speaks. I'm a poor, miserable sinner. And then the confession of faith, which is normally um, the, the doctrine of the scriptures uh, as confessed by the church. And we normally use the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Athanasian Creed, or the, the, the Lutheran confessions come to themselves, they come to us as, and present themselves as confessional documents. In other words, here's what the church has rallied around and believes. So in 1580, they, they gathered together these 10 documents and said, he, he, these documents are definitional of the church's confession. And, and we hold to that and we believe it and we rejoice in it, that these are a right exposition of the scriptures. There's a lot of churches that say, well, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't add anything to the scripture. Sola Scriptura means that we don't have confessions, creeds and things like this. But when Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 10 says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father, he makes the church a confessional church. So every Christian is called to be confessional. It's just not, what is that confession going to be? And so we hold to the 1580 Book of Concord. There's a lot of old fights about that. Like I was in Denmark a couple of years ago, and the, all those um, Scandinavian countries never received the Book of Concord. They never received the formula of Concord. There's some, I can't, I can never remember, I think it's Christian the second or something, the king of Denmark, whose sister was married to one of the confessors uh, who wrote the formula or who accepted it. And she sent his, her, her brother a copy of the formula of Concord and he burned it because he says, we just need the Augsburg Confession and the small catechism. And so from the beginning, there's been a big division about what, what texts are your Lutheran canon. I remember just like the similar thing. I was in Madagascar and the only confessional documents they had were the small catechism and the Augsburg Confession, because they were started by a Norwegian mission society, and the other documents of the Book of Concord weren't that important, but they were start, there was a, a revival of interest in those texts that was happening there. And it's pretty important. I mean, it's an, an amazing thing to see that history kind of come to bear because you have the ELCA. This is why, by the way, like all the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America stuff is called Augsburg, and all the Missouri Synod stuff is called Concordia. It goes back to that old division, and they just want the Augsburg Confession. But the problem is if you don't have the full book of Concord, especially if you don't have the formula of Concord, you are not inoculated against Calvinism. So I, I wonder if that would be a way to encourage the ELCA to read it because I, most of the ELCA folks are big pro on the vax, you know, so like, hey, here's a vaccination for you. <laughs> Another one, the formula of Concord is a theological vaccination against Calvinism, but because they don't have that in their system, it's easy for that to creep in. And these agreements with like the Presbyterians are natural for them. Uh, it's the, sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but 
maybe so one more point is that the uh, the questioner made this point about the Book of Concord and the closed table. And I think that's right, because closed communion is basically based on two on th two theological understandings. First, that it is possible to take the Lord's Supper to your own to your own spiritual or physical detriment. That's the warning that Paul gives. And so we want to have pastoral care for communion. But really, closed communion is not about pastoral care and worthy communion, but simply about taking the doctrine seriously. So when when Paul uh, when Paul says there's divisions among you, so you don't have the supper, what he's doing is he's saying that that it's at the Lord's Supper that theological unity is expressed. And if you give up thinking that there can be theological unity, then it doesn't make sense to practice closed communion. And most people who practice open communion also practice despair over theological unity. In other words, they say it's not going to be possible for the church to agree on everything, so we're going to stop trying. So those two things are equated. So I, I think that's right. In other words, you, that was a long way of saying, I think they're, I think the emailer has answered the question right. I think they, they got it. And perhaps to add to something you said, the, we believe that the formula of Concord, and our Lutheran fathers believe this, that it was nothing other than a right exposition of the Augsburg Confession. Mm -hmm. So that if you, if you really believe the Augsburg Confession, it shouldn't be a huge leap to accept then the formula according to them. Like you should right. want to jump at the opportunity because it just... It just is clarifying and explaining some things that came up, especially not just with the Calvinists, but even um, within Lutheran circles, yep. um, some issues to clarify things. Otherwise, you're rehashing those arguments, which we see, I think, all the time right now, um, rehashing the same arguments again and again and again, rather than the moving on. That, that's right. And the formula also gives yes. some care. It gives us a way also to understand Luther, which is helpful because it's by it's Luther's own students. Here's how he should be understood. But. It, it it brings an extra layer of care to things like the bondage of the will. So here's mm -hmm. how to here's how to think about this, and here's how to understand some of the more extreme statements of Luther. Like, are are we by nature? Is our nature sin? For example, are are we sin as humans? So that's a big question that's there too, and so that's also very important. And the formula of Concord is the most biblical of all of our Lutheran documents. I mean, you'll see that they, they, and they show you how to do the theology. They say, here's the question, and they clarify the positions. Some say this, some say this. What Now, what does the Bible say? And it starts with the scriptures. And then it'll start with the Augsburg Confession, and then the other confessional documents. Uh, large, small catechism, small called apology. And then uh, the other quotations of the ancient church fathers, as well as the, as well as the, the Lutheran, the Lutheran fathers. So it teaches us how to do theology as well, which is really great. I mean, the form of Concord is a is a brilliant document. It's it's a uh, it's astonishing the way that they they put that together. And our Book of Concord is really. I mean, you're right that the formula is an exposition of the Augsburg Confession. So the Augsburg Confession is the chief document, but the Book of Concord is really the formula of Concord. I mean, it was the formula that decided that this book should be creeds. Augsburg Confession, Apology, Small Called Catechisms, and they and they put it all together. In, in some ways, all the nine documents that come before it are prefaced to the formula of Concord, and they're referring back to it and, and presenting them to us. So the formula written in 1577 necessitated the publication of the, Augs of the, of the Book of Concord, 1580, because that is a, the, here's our standards. I think another point you made that's really important in these discussions is you have people say things today like no creed but Christ, but credo, the Latin just means I believe. So if you say I believe in no creed but Christ, you've still made a creed. It's just a poor one um, that's also not found in the Bible either, but it's you're still confessing something. Everyone's making a confession. Everyone has a public confession, whether they right. know it or not. So our question with being a confessional Lutheran is, are you in line with this particular set of teachings um, this particular set of documents or not? It's, it's yeah. a pretty straightforward question. Yeah. It, it's amazing that, um, so I, and I think this, when someone asks me, what is a confessional Lutheran? I, I, the, there's a lot of divisions, especially in the Missouri Synod, the ways to think about this. Here's, here's how I like to think about it, is that there are those who are ashamed of the Lutheran part of being Lutheran, 
and those who are not. And and the, I think the confessional Lutherans are the ones who are not ashamed of the Lutheran part. It just seems like there's a, you know, there's churches who who think that the name Lutheran or the baggage of Lutheran is detrimental to the work of the church. And there's those that are thinking, no, no, it's essential to the work of the church. I'm of that. I'm of that idea that's essential. I'm sympathetic to the guys who want to take Lutheran out of their name and who want to who want to hide the Lutheran stuff because there is a lot of Lutheran baggage. But why not? And this is something that, you know, you and I've talked about, too. Why not change what people think about what it means to be Lutheran? <laughs> why not? Why not? Why not? When people think about Lutheran, I don't know what they think about now. Maybe they don't think about anything. They've never heard of it or whatever. Maybe they think about like grumpy people eating lutefisk or something. <laughs> I don't know. Why not change the idea that what people think of when they think of Lutheran? I was up in Iowa this week at a conference and I said, look, at the Lord has not given us the option of being joyful in the midst of of sorrow he has not given us the option of being hopeless in the midst in the midst of this darkness no so that the church people say oh the lutherans oh they're the joyful hopeful christians <laughs> who are really strong on doctrine and also who are always ready to be compassionate you know why why just why not start to shape the way that people think about what it means to be lutheran that's that's what i'd like to do uh, i think that even goes with the, the title confession lutheran right so i think there's guys that are concerned because when you have so many ELCA, ELCA Lutheran stuff getting out there, like the Sparkle Creed you just reviewed, uh, when that's out there and attached to Lutheran, I think guys get uneasy. But at the same time, we have a similar problem with even the title Confessional Lutheran. Uh, I think a lot of people, even in our own synod, see that as the grumpy, um, you know, the grumpy guys, uh, not not the joyful guys. So I think that is, you know perception issue that we should work on changing that <laughs> confessional Lutherans are filled with joy because we, we have the true doctrine. <laughs> right. It's, it, it, there's a weird thing and this is just, it's just wrong, but it's a psychological thing where people think that if I'm serious, I have to be grumpy or angry and I show my seriousness over something by my grumpiness or anger. That's what I, that's how I, that's how I indicate to you how serious I am. And, and it's just not biblical. The Lord is, not called us to he is not equated seriousness and joylessness he, it's the opposite is that the most serious of all things which is repentance is what gives us joy and i've been thinking I, i've been thinking about this how you know we have the three slaveries and three freedoms that are outlined in the in the prodigal son so the first slavery is belly slavery where the son leaves and the first freedom is contrition so the second slavery is despair i'm not worthy to be called your son the second freedom is faith so the first so the, put those two together you got repentance and he's back he's restored the third slavery is the tricky one that's the pride of the older son all these years i've served you done everything you asked you never gave me a goat so it's this it's a slavery of thinking that god owes us something this is the pharisaical slavery and the third freedom is joy in other people's salvation because it turns out in the parable that like we don't know if the goat or sorry the if the if the lamb was happy in being found we don't know if the coin was happy in being found we don't know how the prodigal son reacted when he when the father scooped him up but we know that the shepherd and the woman and the father and the angels are happy when others repent and so the angelic joy is the joy of other people's salvation and the lord is calling us to this kind of expansive life of joy knowing that god is not only my savior but your savior and the savior of my family and friends and neighbors, and also of my enemies, even the people that I'm not sure should be saved. He's also saves them. And that joy, there's a freedom in the joy of that salvation. So, so there's an, a, there's a, there's a slavery in, in grumpiness. And we gotta, we, pr we gotta work on that. I think Chesterton summed it up nicely when he said angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. Um, <laughs> Right. And I think reading Chester is a good antidote for some of that because he's filled with wonder, right? Um, and maybe if we're filled with more wonder over salvation, over creation, over these things, uh, there's there's not a lot of room for grumpiness if you're filled with wonder over all of these things. And, and I think that was kind of Chesterton's point. If you take yourself too seriously, uh, you're not really filled with the wonder and joy that, that the Lord's given you in all of these gifts. Here's Pastor Packer trying to start the Lutheran uh, version of the Chesterton Society. Let's do it. <laughs> Good.
All right. The, the next question, this one, these last couple have just come in this week. Um, this one's about the difference between conviction of sin and accusation. Uh, can you explain the difference between being convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit versus being accused of sin by the devil and how this plays out in the Christian walk? Hmm. That's a wonderfully insightful question. Um, the Maybe the answer is, can we do it this way? That uh, there's a di the accusation of sin and conviction of sin is in the moment the exact same, but it has a different source, cause, and end. Uh, so that the Holy Spirit would convict us of sin uh, for two reasons. Number one, so that we could repent of our sin and rejoice in the Lord's forgiveness. And so that we would fight against sin and try to serve and bless the neighbor instead of hurt and harm them by that sin. So different source and, and the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin because he loves us. That's the so the Holy Spirit in love brings the conviction of sin for the purpose of repentance and good works. The devil brings the accusation of sin out of hatred and malice and not so that we would repent and do good works of service but so that we would either despair or um, uh, boast. So, so remember that the, the temptation from the devil comes in, in two waves. The first is before we sin, at least two ways. But then after we sin, and that's the big test, actually. Now that I've sinned, what am I going to do with it? And there's a lot of things that the devil wants us to do. He wants us to hide our sin so that it festers and it starts to mutilate the conscience. Or he wants us to um, boast in our sin, not be ashamed of it at all. So he's always pushing us to pride or despair over our sin. Or I think there's another tactic of the devil is that he tries to minimize our sin so that we go back to it over and over again. He tries to get us caught in habitual sin, looping sin. Oh, look, nobody was hurt. It's fine. Uh, you won't surely die. That kind of thing. So that he can he can use it against us, and he's he's manipulating and harden, hardening the conscience where we and we don't even notice it. And this is the purpose of the this is the devil's purpose with our sin. I, and I think that there's a way that you know some sin that we commit registers in the conscience, and others is be, is below the threshold of where we our conscience is tenderized. So, like I might if I lose my temper, I, it might trouble my conscience. But there's a festering bitterness that I might not even notice that I'm sinning against. If the devil gets us down there where our, our conscience is calloused, he just uses us to hurt people. We don't even notice it. Uh, but he's always working on that threshold, so it gives him more space to use us to sin against people. So they have very different sources and very different goals. But when you're in the midst of it, like, oh, I've sinned, it's very difficult to tell, did that, come, did that conviction come from the Holy Spirit or did it come from the devil? And in a way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like the devil could show us our sin. And there's, there's all these great Luther quotes about this where he thanks the devil for showing him his sin. Because when the devil shows us our sin, he is showing us a sin that's died for by Jesus. He's showing us a sin that's forgiven. He's showing us a sin that, where the punishment has already been uh, suffered and where salvation has already been achieved. So we could, even if the devil is the one who's accusing us of our sin, we can receive it as a gift from God. So in the midst of it, we don't know the difference, but in the midst of it, we don't need to know the difference. We know that if I see my sin, if the Lord is letting me see my sin, it is for the purpose of, of repentance and love. And so we can have that, that confidence that it doesn't really matter if it's the devil doing it. We, could, we can receive it as a gift from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I... It's, as you said, similar to temptation and testing, right? The Lord tests our faith to strengthen our faith, and the devil tempts us to destroy us. And e even in that, right, Luther says, if the devil's driving us to Jesus in temptation, then then that helps us. So right. if the devil accuses us and we go running to Jesus when he wants us to despair, then it's backfired and actually done us a great deal of good. So it's it's all about in the moment, you know, and maybe, what does Luther say? Um, yeah, you're right. And I've done even worse than that. Go, go tell it to Jesus. Uh, go, go take it to him. 
because he's interceding for me at the right hand of the father. So yeah. we don't ha even have to, <laughs> even when he accuses us, we can agree and say, yeah, it's actually worse than that. <laughs> right. you, you've only scratched the surface. It's far worse than that, but you should go take it up with Jesus because he's already dealt with this. Yeah. I mean, when the devil says, you look, you're a sinner. We're like, I know. I, that's what I confess. That's what Jesus taught me. And I confess it. And it's true. And, uh, but I'm a forgiven sinner. So the, so the devil goes too far when he tries to, when he brings accusations, God be praised. When he starts to bring condemnation, when he starts to pretend like he's more than the accuser and he starts to act like the judge, that's where he's gone past his vocation. And so I've sinned. Yes. Therefore I will be condemned. No. Christ is the judge, not the devil. And so when the devil, he tries to get us so worked up in our own sinfulness that he can sneak in there and act like the judge, like sit on the Lord's throne. What's that movie? Where is it? Uh, who is it? Is it, is it uh, the Emperor's New Groove? And he goes in and he's like, off the throne. <laughs> You're sitting on the throne, off the throne. But that's, the devil's always trying to creep up and sit on the throne and say, I condemn you. Well, okay, fine. I, but you're not the condemner. God is. I'm not afraid of the one who can destroy my body, but body and soul and hell. And that's not the devil. That's, that is only the Lord Jesus who was appointed to judge. And so, uh, and so we let him, uh, we let the Lord be the judge. We can't, we can't let the devil steal that vocation. And when we're convicted by the law, um, we were just talking about confession a moment ago. Um, when we're convicted by the law and we confess that God's right, right? We say, you're right about this. I'm wrong. I sinned. Um, and when the devil accuses us, we can still confess and say, you were right about that. But <laughs> here's, here's the rest of the picture, which I think is why, right. If we, if we have scripture memorized, there is no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we have, if we have the, take the scripture to heart. And when the devil comes with his accusations, we can, can, can use them to our advantage rather than have to suffer under them. Yeah, that's right. I, there's one more thing that occurred to me is, is that it could be, uh, 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 what, one of the ways that, I mean, the, the questioner could also be wondering, what if the accusation that I feel is wrong? Like, how do I know, like, mm. say I'm being accused of sin or I feel guilt in my conscience, but I'm not sure that it's actually that I've done something wrong. Like I got an email this morning that said, uh, you sin. <laughs> and it was, so it was, it was accusing me of sin. And now I got to sit here and say, okay. Now, is that the Holy Spirit? Is that a gift from the Holy Spirit? It, it is a gift from the Holy Spirit, but I got to say, is that right? Is that, is that something, is, have I done something that I need to repent of or not? And now I have to judge that by the scriptures. So the devil would bring false guilt, guilt over things that are not sin. That's his business, actually. He, he's trying to transfer guilt onto good works and confidence onto sin. So he wants me to feel good about my sin and bad about my good works. And so, and, and, you, and it doesn't seem like that would be such a tricky thing, but it is like, I, I remember one time I did a good work. It was like, I managed to do a good work once and all <laughs> hell broke loose. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is not how I grew up. My parents taught me, if you're good in church, you go to McDonald's, you know, you get rewarded for good behavior and you get punished for bad behavior, but the devil is trying to flip that all around. And so you get punished for good behavior all hell breaks loose when you do something decent. So, uh, so it's always that flip. So I always have to go to the scripture and say, is my guilt right? Because I, because it, ha because it has to align with the 10 commandments. So the 10 commandments calibrate the conscience. They make sure that the conscience is functioning in the proper parameters. And so, and so that's one of the ways that we can also just, um, distinguish between the two because the devil will want us to feel bad uh, i remember someone was telling the story about the guy who was he was cheating on his wife so he went and bought a uh like a ford prius in other words he he he, did, he didn't have guilt over adultery he had guilt over his like carbon imprint right and so you do the act of atonement by getting an electric vehicle and and that's the way so the, and that's a kind of extreme example but the devil's always doing this for each one of us that we we feel bad for the things that we shouldn't and we don't feel bad for the things that we should. So we, we always are going back to the scriptures to let the spirit work through the word, especially the Ten Commandments, to do that work. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Um, I have a 
another question. I'm skipping some ones I mentioned because I'm looking at the time. Yep, yep, no problem. But um, uh, it's a longer question. I'm going to read the the main part of it because I, I don't think we need all of the background. But essentially, uh, she has a friend who is struggling with this question. Um, is God egotistical or narcissistic? If all he made us for was to worship him, we have to have another reason to be here. Um, so that's, that's her friend's struggle. Uh, what would you tell her? There is one of the beauties of our Trinitarian theology is that there is a way for God who is wonderful and above all who is the most glorious and exalted thing in all of the universe, who is the creator of all of creation, and who is wonderful beyond our imagining and worthy of worship from everyone. There's a way that our Trinitarian theology lets God also be about the other in eternity, so that the Father in eternity is defined as father of the son in other words the father who should be of himself is not essentially even of himself but of the other his son and the son is pleased to be not I mean, you know all these these other gods are not father son the holy spirit but just they stand alone they're just by themselves but the son is of the father and the spirit is proceeding from the father and the son and so there is this love and, and conversation and even giving of gifts from father to son and son to father and father and son to spirit and spirit to father and son that exist even before creation. So that, so that God is now, when creation comes, now continues to be defined as love in the act of giving. So that worship, and this is how there's a there's a beautiful way that Philip Melanchthon in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession defines worship in this way. He, he talks about the worship of the law and the worship of the gospel. The worship of the law is to give to God the things he demands. The worship of the gospel is to receive from God the things that he gives. And this is how God desires to be worshipped, that we receive from him uh, his good gifts. So that worship is not simply giving God the glory and honor that he desires, but worship is chiefly receiving from him the gifts that he wants to give. So that the son, and, and, and you see this when Jesus talks about the father, that everything the father gave to me, uh, I, I receive, I win it back from him. We see the whole kind of redemption of history, if we look at it in Trinitarian terms of the father is winning the world for the son to give him as a gift. And now the son is giving the world back to the father and that we're part of this magnificent giving of gifts from the father to the son and back to the father and back. And the Holy spirit is working in all of these things. And so to be, and so to, to be a part of that is an astonishing thing to think of that the father says, he looks at the son in love and says, I can think of nothing better to give to you than Brian Wolfmuller and Andrew Packer. And we're like, what? <laughs> whoa, whoa. And then the son says, oh, father, it's so precious. I'm, I'm now presenting them to you as holy so that the Lord takes his church and gives it to the father. So that, and, and, it, and I'd just say, if that, so that is worship is that we receive from the Lord that which he gives. But it, I think it goes even further in the sense that, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit did not remain then distant from us, but actually come, the Son humbles himself for us men and for our salvation, comes down and into our own, shares in our flesh and blood so that he can partake in our death, so he can destroy him who has the power of death, so that the Lord is now with us according to our humanity in order to serve us. And this is the, the worship that we receive from him, that when we see Jesus washing his disciples feet which is just a getting them ready for him dying on the cross this is this this heavenly picture of here's what god does for us so we, we could just maybe kind of summer like in in eternal life who's going to be washing whose feet are we going to be washing the feet of jesus is that our eternity or in a way is jesus going to be 
washing our feet. That's the that's the worship of eternal life. Now, again, I not literally. I don't think we have dirty feet in the resurrection, but this is it. Is that eternity is the worship of receiving the Lord's blessings from Him, saying Amen to His gifts. I was thinking as you were talking about uh, Paul Gerhardt's wonderful line: "Love caused your incarnation. Love brought you down to me." Uh, if if we understand creation, redemption, and uh, sanctification, the three parts of the creed as being gifts of God's love, it changes the conversation um, that our worship, any praise we give is in response to, to the love that's already been given. Um, or as Augustine said, like the Lord created out of love to have objects of love. Um, if you start with the premise that God only created for us to, to be, to have someone to worship him because he's uh, worthy of it, which is true. But if, if you start with the premise, that's the only reason he created us, then you kind of miss the entire biblical story. Um, and, it, and also, if that was true, if it was just because he needed someone to worship him, then he would have wiped out the Israelites and us like long ago for being pretty, pretty, pretty poor and pathetic at doing doing it the way he's commanded us to. So if that's all it was, um, I don't think the earth would have survived these thousands of years. Um, that's right. <laughs> I need something more glorious to reflect my own glory rather than you guys. Here's Revelation 4, verse 11. So this is the, the whole hymn of worthiness. So this is the worship of the Father. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Then, though, to the Lamb in chapter 5, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests of our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So that Jesus claims, I mean, he, he doesn't say, worship me for my glory. He says, worship me for the forgiveness of sins. It, it's, a, it's a very, worship me because of the wounds that I have on the cross. That, that's the, in other words, I'm with you according to my kindness. And, that, and our worship grows out of that. That's the worship of faith. Well, and, and in John's gospel, same John that wrote uh, what you just read there, right? Where is the son glorified? He's glorified on the cross, right? Stripped, beaten, bleeding, uh, naked, hanging there, dying is where he's, the son is glorified. Um, and so too, like when we talk about us glorifying God, which does include worship and praise, but as you p rightly pointed out, if we start with understanding that glorifying God first begins with us receiving all the wonderful gifts he gives out of his love, um, and then two, serving the neighbor starts out of what? Love. The love that we receive from God pours forth to our neighbor. Um, if love's the center of it, I think it changes the entire conversation. And hopefully, um, as some of the other conversations we had today, changes the way uh, the Christian lives. If he understands that love is a foundation, then he doesn't need to be grumpy or arrogant. He can live in joy because he's loved by the Father. Um <laughs> And everything comes from from his hands, the hands that are that created the world, and the, and those hands of Jesus that were pierced for us. Every no, no matter what, it, it comes from his hands. God be praised. Hey, thanks for those those great questions. Uh, those of you who are listening, hopefully that was helpful for you. Keep sending those questions at wolfmuller.co/contact. Master Packer will line them up, and we'll. I think this is great uh, first time. So let us know how the format was. By the way, we'd love the feedback. Uh, but I think we'll keep doing this and cranking these questions out. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being part of the fun. Uh, may the Lord bless and keep you now and always until we see him in the joy of eternal life uh, before his face. God be praised.